Right, everybody, welcome. Uh, hi, and thank you for joining today's webinar, The Third Teacher, How Classroom Design Can Positively Impact Student Experience. Just a bit of housekeeping before we begin. This webinar is being recorded and closed captions are available at the bottom of your screen. We're keen to get your thoughts and questions, so there is a Q&A button at the bottom left hand of your screen. Please feel free to populate this throughout the session. Now, on to today's presenters. Firstly, I'm joined by Peter Gamble an education consultant, former teacher and education architect. Peter has been in the education field for about nine years and has amassed a wealth of knowledge and experience on improving students' learning experiences that he's kindly sharing with us today. So thank you very much for being with us today. Also speaking mm -hmm. is Luke McSorley. Luke is our prod uh, broadcast product manager here at Display Notes, who's been passionate about making lessons more accessible and engaging for everyone for the last 11 years. That is dedication. So uh, we'll be kicking off today's webinar with Peter, and then we're going to follow that with a short Q&A session, and then Luke's going to introduce us to the benefits of broadcast, and we'll close this session with any remaining questions or thoughts. So chaps, welcome. Nice to see you both. Thank you. Thanks for the intro. Yep. Thank you for the intro, and thank you for the invite. So um, <clears throat> as Leanne uh, said, I'm going to start us off. Um, and so I'm just going to share my screen. That should be up now. Mm -hmm. Correct. You're good to go. Blame. So um, <clears throat> I'm going to begin with a quote. Um, <clears throat> the Radio Emilio philosophy, it talks about three educators um, being present in a classroom at any one time. You have the teacher, you've got the child, and then you have the environment. <clears throat> the approach stresses that the role of the environment can be a third teacher in total, or sorry, in the total interactive educational experience. Now, I find that quite a fascinating idea. The classroom environment, instead of something where um, the learning happens, um, something that can be an active participant in that process. Um, and then the question becomes, how, as an educator, can um, you use the environment, use that classroom to positively have an influence on your pupils' learning outcomes? Um, so today I'm going to begin by going through a little bit of background research on this topic. Uh, then I'm mainly going to focus on ideas that um, educators might try within their own classrooms. Briefly summarise it, and then, <clears throat> as Leanne said, we'll have some uh, questions and discussion between us afterwards. Um, I've also um, got some references there of the material that I've looked at, so they'll be included as well, should you want to um, look at those and take a bit of a deeper dive into the information. So background research. Um, there's a, there's a project, the Holistic Evidence and Design Project, the acronym being HEAD. Um, this was carried out by the Salford University in Manchester, England um, in 2015. The report produced by it um, looks into the design side of classrooms, um, how things like decisions that the architects and design teams can impact the end goal of enhancing the people's learning. <clears throat> the findings... <clears throat> pardon me, also highlights some important areas that can help guide teaching practice after the physical classroom has been constructed. Because let's face it, um, educators more often than not inherit a classroom um, and are not privileged enough to be part of the design, initial design process. Uh, the research took place over three years. Um, over 153 classrooms from 27 different schools. Um, and they collected performance um, statistics for the pupils studying in those spaces. This quote on the screen is kind of the, the headline of it, the, the outcome, um, where they conclude that differences in physical characteristics of classrooms can explain up to a 16% variation in learning progress over a year. The key areas that the report highlights are naturalness, <clears throat> um, accounting for about 49% um, of that 16, 
percent increase, then individualization, 28 percent, and stimulation is 23 percent. Um, quite surprisingly, within the report, um, whole school factors such as the actual size of the school overall, um, navigation routes, specialist facilities, play facilities did not seem to have anywhere near as much influence as naturalist individualization stimulation. Um, <clears throat> This point's kind of reinforced by their findings that within any one school, uh, you can have classrooms, some classrooms are more effective than, than others. So um, that points towards what well, could quite positive in that you do have um, a degree of power as a classroom teacher to tailor your classroom to, to have um, quite large um, large effects on the learning. So naturalness, um, light temperature, air quality, it's a bit more at a design level. However, <clears throat> as a teacher, you can make the environment comfortable, <laughs> you know, close the blinds if it's a really sunny day, um, turn the heating on or off, um, you know, open windows. Simple things in life. Yeah, those, you know, just, just making sure that everyone's kind of comfortable enough. Um, Individualization and stimulation are two that you can probably have the most impact. Um, individualization can support um, a variety of opportunities, choice the pupils empowering in their learning journey. Um, it can also include considerations for perhaps the modes of learning. Um, you know, people talk about um, whether you're a visual learner or whether you favor auditory learning. Uh, kinesthetic reading and writing so individualization can start to accommodate um, variation there um, then there's stimulation now I've highlighted appropriate here because it's um, the relationship is kind of curvy linear or a bell-shaped curve in that as stimulation increases um, learning outcomes improve but to a points <laughs> over which if there's too much stimulation then it begins to um kind of, yes, yes it it does. Does. <laughs> not all the time <laughs> um so yeah this report um as i was saying it th there are factors which as a teacher you can influence and that leads me on to what i'd like to talk about now so onto kind of things that you might wish to try in your classrooms. Um, so I've kind of made the point, if only briefly, that the classroom environment's important. Um, just before I start here, I'd like to um, just mention an excellent book that is in the references, Dynamically Different, um, uh, Dynamically Different Classrooms, and that includes a it's a treasure trove. It's a wealth of ideas and knowledge um, of different things that you can try. Um, <clears throat> uh, so over the following slides, I'm going to pick out some examples. They're going to be mixed with my own experiences and uh, my own research. Um, and I hope that they kind of can spark some ideas um, and be a bit more useful than simply say in the classroom environment is important. So, you know, go away and think about it. <laughs> um, I've broken this down, so we're going to talk about walls, broadly speaking, the displays, the ceiling as an idea for storage um, in the more long term of knowledge, uh, floors about movement and then zoning um, about choice. So to begin with the walls, um, these can be, you know, they're not just structural supports. Um, they're not just display areas for pretty pictures. Um, they can function as you know, something to interact with and deepen uh, the learning. Um, you can draw clear links back to individualization and the stimulation um, highlighted in the head report. Um, so to begin with, working walls. Uh, here you'd consider displays not as static repositories um, of knowledge, but as displays that can change and evolve lesson by lesson, updated constantly. Um, this is something that was used a lot in uh, my old school. Um, we quite simply use large flip chart paper um, 
to record parts of the lessons and then this could literally be taken off and put on the wall that's as simple as it can be um sometimes i you know i think of the display boards as a bit like a detective board um where as the topic went on you kind of gather more um evidence <laughs> for the case or whatever it's like <laughs> you know um uh and you know um Essentially, you simply cannot assume that if something's on the wall, the pupils are going to memorise it and it's going to be retained. Um, displays need to be continuously interacted with um, by the teacher and by the pupils, um, and that elevates the information in stature. Um, moving on, you choose. So this is a variation on the working wall theme, but instead of the teacher being in charge of what goes on the walls, you um, empower the pupils to do that. So you could split the class into groups at uh, uh, primary level um, around core subjects or in secondary, um, you might allocate, um, you know, the display area to each year group, as it were. Um, the groups then, they themselves decide what is going to go up onto the walls, what they think is most useful from the learning. Um, and relevant. <clears throat> I guess even it's just uh, interacting with the with the material and then processing it that way is going kind of to help them remember it and sort of store it there. Yeah, you. Yeah, that that would be that that would ultimately be the idea. So if you know, it's in some ways it's better than the working walls because you're 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 getting the pupils involved yeah. straight away. Um, <clears throat> And then, you know, something that's nice about that or something, you know, you can add to any display is getting groups of pupils to then label the content. Now, that might be with, um, you know, learning objectives or learning statements, picking out the points that, um, you know, meet learning targets, if you, if you want to put it like that. Um, then the final idea here is it's a cover up. Um, this is a bit like uh, the memory game or Kim's game, if, if you've heard of it called that. Uh, you come in, you basically put sticky notes and cover up bits of the displays. Um, it might be words, phrases, sentences, um, images, and then you challenge the class to reproduce that missing information, um, maybe in groups to um, stimulate discussion, uh, maybe as individuals, but could you remember what's there? Um, overall, the key idea here is that the learning needs to come off the wall and back into the lesson. Um, <clears throat> It's a continuous cycle. Um, there's a quote in Gadsby and Evans, which I like, is if it's merely beautiful, why not just put up Laura Ashton? <laughs> um, which I think highlights the <laughs> highlights the point. So on to ceilings. Um, here, um, I'd say you can think of the ceiling as somewhere perhaps to store knowledge on the in the longer term. Um, uh, it's an opportunity that where you can put distance between um, the learner and their learning. Um, <clears throat> again, you get links back to um, stimulation through, uh, you know, these ideas can be quite novel and in being such quite memorable and useful, useful in that respect. Um, so three ideas again, starting off with time capsules, which is kind of what you might think it's akin to burying a time capsule in your garden um, but instead of that it's hanging from the classroom ceiling so the displays that we just talked about um, at the end of a topic you might um, carefully take them down unpick and curate some of the key information from them and then store them in you know bottles containers boxes chained up whatever whatever you um is appropriate to your classroom and then suspending them from uh, from the ceiling to later be you know cut down and let loose reintroduced into into the classroom learning and i guess it's even just about off the you know as pupils come into the classroom the next day or next week and see the the, the capsule hanging there and remember oh yeah i remember we put x in the into that box any kind of bit of reinforcement there as well yeah like that like a, a visual um a visual trigger something yeah. that you know is they're continuously that just that 
drip, drip, drip reminding things. So there's so much build-up to that as well, like the conclusion of actually opening it and, and actually yeah. seeing it through the year in that respect of, okay, we've still got this to do. Yeah, yeah, I'd hope, yeah, I'd hope so, yeah, that that could, yeah, those... Also be used as pinatas. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, actually... I'd never thought of that. Yeah, put them in. Well, <laughs> actually, you lead me on to, to the next idea, tasty tacos. It could be uh, piñatas. Um, so this is a variation whereby the pupils, um, uh, instead of using stuff from the displays, um, the pupils would be storing knowledge themselves. So they could, and I, I would suggest they might write them as, um questions or tasks riddles clues images and you'd essentially take a paper plate and you would fold it over on itself and then um staple the edges leaving a gap so you could put a piece of string through it before stapling it together however you you fill that taco with these bits of paper that the pupils have filled in um, or if you've got a piñata, <laughs> you fill it full of the confetti of those bits of paper, and then these are suspended in the, you know, in the classroom. Again, um, you know, they come down one day, and you could, you know, the pupils who made them might do their own, or you might switch them around with other pupils. Um, but again, it's about revising, bringing back that previous learning and knowledge into the classroom in a, in a fresh way, hopefully. Um, and then the final idea, it's, this is again a, ver a variation on a theme, but it is the holiday season and um, you could make some paper chains um, uh, to put up in the classroom as festive decorations. Um, with these, you know, the, the pieces of paper themselves would have um, records of learning ideas written down by the pupils you could with this take the metaphor of a chain as quite literally links between the learning so the order in which the chain is constructed could in itself become important um essentially again the overall idea here is that the ceiling's not subject to frequent change so there's a potential to include in it or in a display purpose, um, more significant overarching aspects of the curriculum. Um, but as with the walls, it should be a, um, a cycle between the classroom and these displays, but with the ceiling over a longer period of time. Um, <clears throat> moving on to the floors. So the floor, I would say as a means to introduce movement into the classroom, that you're away from the constraints of the desk. Um, punctuating a lesson with movement can help to re-energize um, a class. Firstly, the entrance, the exit, quite literally the threshold between the classroom. So as the pupils enter or exit the room, um, you could place a large scale stimulus akin to a doormat, uh, which they have to physically step over. Um, that could be, um, you know, it could be an intriguing image or question. It could be a keyword, a provocative statement. It could be a clue. It could be an affirmation. It could be a mantra. Um, it could really be anything that lends itself to kind of kicking off um, the tone of the learning that's ahead. Uh, challenge tag. This is <clears throat> just a game that I used to play within the classroom. Um, uh, getting the pupils out of their seats. So the idea here is that you stand up, each people, everyone would stand up, they'd find a space within the classroom. As the teacher, you would ask questions. A correctly answered question allows you to move a set number of steps, maybe harder questions, you can move three steps, easier questions, one step. And if you move close enough to be able to tag one of the other members of the class, they're out of the game and they have to sit down. Um, the point being is that it's just to consider how a quick game can be useful to give a little break to the pupils, but also um, can be can link to the learning. Um, even just the active movement as well. And the yeah, novelty of it. Absolutely, and you know, I'd I'd play games with my class that you know weren't 
linked to the learning in, in this respect if I saw that they actually needed that little break and it's just for five minutes or, you know, even less. Um, then guided tours. Um, in this idea, uh, you would split the class into kind of A's and B's or ones and twos. And if we go in A's and B's, then the B's would um, close their eyes, be blindfolded, look the other way, however you want to manage it. And A's would be able to see a large image or stimulus. Now, it lends itself very nicely to um, creative writing. So you could show a scene, a landscape, whatever, you know, you're, you're going to be writing about but also you know you it could be a diagram of the circulatory system it could be a, a electric circuit diagram uh and then it's the task of the a to lead the b pupil around that scene it, it, imaginatively within the classroom um and as they do so describing that world or that image to the B pupil so that the B pupil can as best as is available to them imagine that within with and then they have to draw it they have to recreate that image um then you can switch over or you know you can share the images with the class um but again it's they're moving around around the classroom and that's the key idea movement can be used to re-energize pupils thinking about the floor as a means to initiate movement but in a meaningful way finally zones <clears throat> so um whole class teaching is it's common it's powerful and the simple fact remains that often or the simple fact remains that often as teachers we need to work with smaller groups in a more targeted way so um zones can be a means to break down the classroom and allow you to do this in a more efficient manner. Um, again, three ideas start off with a carousel race. Um, this um, can be used as a good revision activity um, where you would set out um, uh, problems or questions <clears throat> um, and then individuals or groups would have to move around the classroom solving these as they went only allowed to move to the next one when they'd solved the previous problem you can set it up as a race um it was um, very popular with the classes i taught um again as a revision activity um a variation on this might be um it could be a mystery that they have to solve a kind of escape room type type thing um, or game um uh, then uh, uh, challenge zones, sorry, moving on to that. Um, these can be set up in part of the classroom as somewhere where you might challenge um, uh, higher level thinking or problem solving or pupils that have finished the task of the lesson, the main body of the lesson um, ahead or you know, fast finishers, if you want to call them that. Um, they could be conundrums, riddles, multiple step problems. Um, pupils could even go there and create their own um, problems to set to other um, pupils in the class. Um, the, the book I mentioned before, then they, they include quite a nice case study of one of these zones where a teacher had set up the area where everything was larger in scale. So the pupils would, they, they kind of laminated um, desks and cupboards and you would draw on these with uh, uh, markers uh, here they said that you know the being away from the constraints of your tech your, your workbook or your a4 paper um just gave your thinking a different space you know um uh, so that that that's kind of the you know I thought that was a nice idea with with that it's something I hadn't I haven't done in my own classroom but I just thought that was that was that sounded like a nice idea to try uh, and then finally atmospheres 
Um, here, I'd say the classroom can be divided into um, distinctive zones. So you could do that by uh, lighting. So one side of the classroom could be dark, one side could be light. In the darker side, you could use um, lamps on the tables. Um, I've used scent diffusers in my classrooms. I've played kind of music, soft music out of Wi-Fi speakers on some of the tables. Um, you could also, which I, I mean, this is fairly common to set up um, uh, maybe single desks that might in some instances be outside of the classroom if that's available to you for certain pupils who uh, might work better in that um, in that setting. Um, you know, you could um, have pupils, if you have a carpet area that they could lie down, they could work on cushions there. Um, you know, or you could set your classroom up where each table has a varying degree of um, uh, help, as it were. So you could have the teacher stationed at one table, a silent table, a group table, whatever kind of really suits your classroom. Um, and would you see there was atmospheres as something that the, you would empower the children to, to, to move between the areas that, that work for them or sort of a bit of, bit of give and take? And... Yeah, down to class management, really. Um, if you have a class where you might need to dictate that a little bit more, maybe to begin with um, and allocate pupils to areas um, and then over time, perhaps, they have, have a bit more freedom or you might have a class where you know they they can just go and get on with it kind of thing yeah, yeah it's just it's just it or to assess, it, how yeah. to assess their own needs yeah you know like that independence. And, and dependence so yeah. i don't need to be in this table anymore because i can't i know what i'm doing yeah. be alone sort of thing you know um and yet the i mean the, the with the zoning Again, get yeah, exactly as you were sort of the, the choice and challenge is mm. is can be a motivating um, factor for for pupils and you know small but regular changes with that um, it could be argued could be you know a bit of training for real life um, uh, classroom zoning activity you know this can be used to facilitate these things. I guess it's a good point when you're saying there about it could be used for real life. It's even that aspect of of helping the people to understand that maybe their needs you know maybe they need a, a darker space to work or maybe they need a bit of light music to work and finding the things that help them sort of i guess go for their day and meet this banner right yeah I, I i think you know if i if i think about my, myself certainly and how i work it's not necessarily well it's not necessarily always the same you know sometimes i might like to have you know, sometimes I'd, I'd love to have had the radio on yeah. in the classroom when I was working, but <laughs> that wouldn't have been practical. Or other times, you know, you, you want bright light to yeah. work in. Or, so <clears throat> absolutely, the, um, developing that understanding of yourself and your yeah. best working practice, I think is a positive thing. Yeah. And allowing pupils the ability to explore that yeah. for themselves Um I'd say could only be could only be a good thing. Um, so they're the ideas that I'd like to share. Um, kind of in summary, um, if I go back to that head project and that statistic that their findings pointed towards differences in the physical characteristics of classrooms can explain a 16% variation. So I think that's something to not be ignored as it were um and that the classroom environment should be considered not just as a place where learning happens but as active in that process so it's a resource that i would say don't don't overlook it um and i mean overall what i've talked about really is it's just good teaching practice and you know i'd imagine that whether it's articulated explicitly or not in these terms um, it mirrors a lot of, you know, the inspirational teaching that's, that's out there. You know, in researching this, there was things I came across that I was doing and saw other teachers doing in the classroom, but I just hadn't 
necessarily thought of it in these terms mm -hmm. um so hopefully maybe some of the stuff's just been you know a helpful reminder maybe just a reassurance about oh yeah i'm doing some good stuff yeah. and it um <laughs> already to a deeper level the benefits of what you're already doing uh, yeah um you know and on top of that maybe you know hopefully it's just there's maybe a few ideas that an educator can add to their you know their toolkit that they use use for ideas for lessons so um yeah I, thank you really for you know spending time to hear hear some of these <laughs> thoughts really and um yeah we'll go on to some questions yeah well uh, i think uh, thanks very much it was uh interesting to, to hear about and I think some of the stuff when you're when you're going for it, you go naturally go to think about younger children, primary school, if you would say more junior, junior ages. But but I'm sure this is relevant for older children, second school, higher level education, and so on as well. Yeah, I, I mean my my personal background as a teacher is is for younger age groups. Is in uh, primary education, um, so I can see. Maybe my my I have a I have a natural bias or leaning <laughs> towards <laughs> um, towards teaching those age groups, uh, but I so far as whether these things are applicable to secondary education, um, I'd say yes. I mean, it would be very rare that a teacher would take something off the shelf and just use it without tweaking it. Um, okay needs must and occasionally you do just do that because <laughs> you don't have the time TV. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um but you know the, the the craft of teaching is really about changing things to suit your pupils and you knowing and understanding their needs um and so i hope that any teacher could take something um and adapt it yeah. you know to whatever age they're teaching now some ideas are just going to be more useful than others of course that's going to be the case so that's why i've tried to include a, a broad range of them so uh, most people will be able to find something that's useful um also so far as i guess secondary pupils um they do talk about it a bit in um uh, one of the sections uh Gatsby and Evans where they they essentially say that initially with secondary pupils some of the ideas that they tried were met with a little bit more sort of teenage cynicism as it were you know folded arms <laughs> and rolled eyes and um but actually that that ice melted quite yeah, quickly yeah. and you know the pupils got into it and then it was actually it was bound to be quite useful and you know useful and, <clears throat> and rewarding so um you know it, it, it's down to the individual classes yeah. so yes i would say it's applicable to secondary um teachers uh, can make of that what they will yeah. you know they're, they're skilled enough to I think that, yeah, yeah. Your, your your point there of you know this, this little teenager I think back back to being 15 and the teacher said okay we're going to build a time capsule and it through all at first I probably would be a bit eye rolling but I know 20 minutes later I'd be having a great yeah. time building my time capsule and <laughs> going back the next day it would, would reinforce something for me. I think especially when you think about what you're saying there about kind of engaging stimulus in children it's probably and I'm not talking from experience here that it's easily activated with a younger child, whereas the teenager or older child, it is a little bit harder to draw out that engagement. So thinking outside the box in that respect, yeah, once you yeah. get past that wall of cynicism, is probably worthwhile. Yeah. yeah. And um Boris, I guess you touched on that a little bit with the with the environment, but as far as laying out of your desks and your chairs and things like that, like is it a very traditional thing you see, you know, everyone sitting looking at the front of the room or you know how do you see that can can impact things um i mean whole whole class teaching i think is is 
is always going to exist. Yeah. Or, you know, so there's, you know, your, your teacher's going to be there, you're going to have your class there. But as for a, a row of desks all pointing the same way, in the style of perhaps a lecture theatre formally, um, that, that can be broken up, I'd argue, and it should be, mm. I'd argue. Um, now, whether that is actually physically moving the desks around um, to facilitate group working or a particular activity that you're doing, um, that that's one way to think of it, or, or simply by you know, grouping the pupils around, pardon me, around the room instead of actually moving the furniture itself. Um, you know, in a in a the classrooms I taught in, um, and with younger pupils, the furniture was almost always arranged in non-standard rows of desks fashion. Um, sometimes it was so. Um, a, you know, older level um, or secondary pupils. I, I, you know, I, I mean, I don't know how easy it is to maybe move those classrooms around so much, but I, you know, the pupils themselves are older and maybe more physically able to, to help you move a classroom around. Um, so the the layout of the furniture it plays its part. But it's not the be all and end all. If if your classroom, if you're in a lecture theatre and you can't move that yeah. furniture, it's not to say you can't do a lot of these activities yeah. um, just by moving the pupils around. Okay, great. And I know you mentioned at the start this idea of you know the, the teacher inherits the classroom. You know, it's not something that you go and. You create your your perfect classroom. You come and teach to you know to make sure that the light is perfect and the heat's perfect and all that kind of stuff. If you were to to you know be able to go and build your own classroom, what what would you do? How would you go about it? <laughs> build my own classroom. Um, I would. Well, I, I suppose you want to get the the design team right you know the, whether that be the, the you know well the architects the designers whoever's involved in in helping yourself or the school um realize those those new learning spaces whether it's the whole school or whether it's some of the classrooms being rebuilt whatever and and to that end i in I'd look into the architect, I would re research them closely. And by research, I mean, don't just go on their website and see that they've won a couple of awards and they have pretty pictures of schools. Like if they, first of all, have they designed schools? And if so, can you get in touch with those schools <laughs> and speak to yeah, yeah. them and say, what was it like working with this design team? What was, what were their strengths? What would you change if yeah. you could do it again? And also, are the, are the spaces, um, you know, are they fit for purpose? Yeah. I are they, are they useful yeah. in the way that you wanted them to be? So I, I, if I was to be able to design be involved as an educator from the get-go with the uh, school design or classroom design that would be where i'd yeah. start I, I really want to know that <clears throat> i was working with the, you know the team being put together was one that was gonna deliver what they what, yeah, what yeah, asked for yeah and be collaborative yeah. and you know good in their their process and their communication. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we've uh, had a question in from one of the listeners, uh, and it's specifically about the uh, book you were mentioning. So, uh, the oh, yes. author of the dynamically different classroom. 
Yes, um, I will put the sorry uh, the references here. Um, so if you look the um, the second one down, it's dynamically different classrooms. Um, it's a book by Claire Gadsby and Jan Evans. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so they're the, they're the two authors, um, and they go through. Um, you know, it is it is a wealth of yeah. stuff about this. There's so many ideas. I mean, when I say so many, it's hundreds, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I've I've read most of it, um, but not all of it. Um, just actually a note on on the references. I said I put them up. I I haven't thus far. Um, uh, some of these are open source. The more academic ones. Um, so you can just download the papers if you want to if you want to read those the books themselves um dynamically different classrooms is uh, kind of more from uh, as i said ideas to try out in the classroom specifically um the planning learning spaces is a bit more from the design side of things architectural um so they're both books as is imagine if creating a future for us all which is by ken robinson and then um his daughter um so those are um you have to pay for them <laughs> essentially um some are more expensive than others um but yeah they're, they're, they're the books <clears throat> that's great thank you <laughs> conscious of time here so i'm going to quickly move on to luke who's going to walk us through the broadcast yes thanks very much um yes leon says uh, with conscious of time, so I'll try not to take too much time. So I see if you can share. Sure. Thank you. And I can please share my screen. Okay. So, yeah, um, I wanted to talk to you through uh, broadcast, which is one of our products here at Display Note. And uh, I guess um, with things that Peter talked about there, like the uh, environment and empowering your, your students to be able to, to go to a part of the classroom that works for them the most, whether it's lower light or you know quieter. Um, it doesn't always mean to get the, the best view of the, the screen. So if you're going over content up the front of the room, you want to make sure that you know your 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 students can can follow along. We want to try and encourage that kind of equality across the classroom. And as well, um I've spoken to a teacher in the past who talked about uh, some of one of her pupils who, you know, if they were getting irritated by people in the in the classroom, someone beside them playing with their pen. They they knew to take themselves away from the situation that that wasn't good for their learning. So they had a little desk set up in, in the hall that they would go and sit at and continue the lesson. But they walk out into the hall and they're not moving part of the lesson, not able to follow along as much. Um, so these are the type of situations that we we hope to try and address a little bit with um, with broadcasting. We zoom out of the way. So first things first, if you put a broadcast online, that's where you can create a broadcast. So I'm going to go there, hit create a broadcast, and I'm going to share uh, a Google slide presentation that I've got. It's just going to start my broadcast up. While that's starting up, um, whenever you send your pupils to broadcast.online to join a session, they're going to see a very basic screen, and all they need to do is enter in the six-digit code and hit the broadcast, and they'll get connected. We wanted to make sure it was easy for the pupils to get in. So the teach you as the teacher are going to be spending a lot of time going, okay, no, you have to be there. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll cover that a little bit more. Good start uh, in a second. Yeah, curse of the demo. That was the best of Yeah. <laughs> Okay, I'm just going to change my source, sorry, to my presentation. Okay, there we go. And go back. Okay, so my broadcast has started. Um, and the first thing I want to point out is uh, the little join panel on, this, on the left hand side here. So as I say, we want to make it really easy for pu pupils to get joined. So we simply tell them to go to broadcast online, enter in the ID. We can also use the um, link, so you can copy that and share that with uh, people. So, for example, I can I can share it into the Zoom call here, and if people want, they can they can join in to see what the students will see. And as well, uh, we've also 
integrated with Google Classroom. So if you're a Google school, this can be really handy for you because it reduces the barriers even further. All you need to do, is select your classroom and hit share link. And all that's going to do is send the share link into your um, uh, Google Classroom. So maybe with my biology, uh, top grade biology, and refresh. You can see I now have a join link, which if I press, you're just going to join into the broadcast uh, with, with uh, one click. So we're just trying to make it as easy as possible to get your students into your broadcast. Um, one thing I'd like to point out with broadcast is we've got this little mode down here, picture in picture mode. Um, whenever you're doing a broadcast, you're not going to be staying on this screen. You're going to go off to your slides, to your content. So I like to point that out because if you open that up, you can have your uh, you can see what your pupils are seeing in the bottom of the screen. So it means I go back to my slides and move through my slides. You can see uh, what your pupils are seeing and you know that they're going to be following along. Um, I mean, that's great outside of the classroom. I don't know how many presentations I've done and I've torn on the head and yeah. they're actually three sides back. Exactly, so, exactly. Yeah, um, so the other thing I want to just go over quickly with you as well is the uh, live draw feature. So this allows you as uh, the teacher to um, annotate on top of the content. So for example, I can, uh, I should have brought my mouse. It's never easy to, to draw with a card pen. You can annotate on top here and mark off that it's a leaf. Um, so you've done that, you've annotated it onto your lesson, but you want to kind of share it out as a record to make sure that um, your pupils remember that later on. So you've got a couple options for sharing. If I hit um, I hit the share button, we have a little share panel. I can download that and just you know keep for a record out of the Dropbox, whatever way you like to work. I can once again add the image directly into Google Classroom. So that's just going to take that image and add it into Google Classroom. But the one that I quite like is a, a Google Slide integration. So if I go to Google Slides and name this, for example, and hit Create, what that's going to do is going to create a, a Google Slide document and add that image uh, to it. Um, so if I now go to my Google Slides, and we just had it created there. I can open up my Google Slide document. And you can see the slides there. But obviously one, one slide is not so good. But if we go back and you know add another label, for example. Just for anyone else, this is exactly what his writing looks like as well. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, bad writing. There's a reason why I got into tech and uh, coding <laughs> and so on. Um, so if I now add to slides and we go back to our Google slide document in a little second, it takes a little second to upload, but you'll see another slide be added into the presentation with the next um, label in. So this is used to broadcaster. As you're going through your lesson, you can uh, annotate on top of stuff. You can collate stuff into a document which can be sent off to the pupils to review later. Mm -hmm. But what I think is probably more interesting is if we still have the uh, a couple of the figures and I'll oh, still got the viewer here. Just move zoom out of the way. And turn off a lot of the captions are hiding up. Um, uh, so this is what do people say? Uh, but say to people, you want to do an exercise where you want the people to label, label stuff, you know, they can also add on. And they can do the same. They can create a Google Slide document and add to it. And this Google Slide document will be the pupil's own Google Slide document. So it's not one that they're sharing with other people. It's not one they're sharing with you. It's one that they're sharing with themselves. You know, everyone learns differently and has different information that they want to make sure they remember. So it means at the end of the lesson, your, your pupils can have a Google Slide document that collates all their information together. They can keep go back to later on. And you as the teacher can have something that you think is useful that you can also share with your your, your students to, to review later. Um, that covers the basics, that, like the basic stuff you can do with broadcast. We do have voice and video as well. So in that scenario where the kid comes out of the room, you can mm -hmm. start your voice and video so they can then follow along outside the room. Um, uh, but um, that, that kind of gives you a rough overview of broadcast. If you have any questions about broadcast or want a more detailed demo or uh, want yeah. to touch, 
I was really interested. There was a couple of things there. I think what stands out for me is the, the potential for accessibility support there in terms of allowing kids to access that information in the way they need to. And also touching on that idea of room layout. Is, yeah. You don't need to worry about that. You know, it's not one or the other. It's yeah. where it's kind of essentially that you have the best of both worlds. Mm -hmm. And we have had a question. I think it's more of a, um, if you, we've had a question about giving us a link to more information about the connected Google Classroom. So mm -hmm. maybe after this, if you've got any uh, blogs or any information on, specifically yeah. the connection to Google Classroom, if you could share that out, and um, that seems to be yeah. appreciated. I, I'll, I'd say I'll certainly do that. I'll make sure, because uh, if you guys keep an eye on your inbox, you're going to be getting a follow-up email that will have a link to the recording, and we'll, mm -hmm. we'll include that information. Hello, this is Luke. I just wanted to quickly interrupt the webinar to show you how to link with Google Classroom, because it's very straightforward. Once you're logged into broadcast and you've started a broadcast, you'll get the little panel here that says Google Classroom. Simply click the toggle to turn it on and you'll get a prompt to sign in with your Google account. If you sign in with your Google account, uh, you'll have to confirm permissions. And then once you've done that, you've linked with Google Classroom and you're able to then also add the Google Slides and so on. So it's as simple as that. Just Click the little toggle and follow the on-screen instructions. In the meantime, if you want to go to support.spleno.com, that's where all our support info is. Mm -hmm. and there's a wealth of videos on there. Or just go to YouTube and type in Spleno and mm -hmm. all the how-tos are, are there for how to use broadcast. And, you know, spleno.com, you can get in touch. Uh, there's contact forms there or broadcast at explainer.com. Just write the explainer. Yeah, so you'll, you'll find us. And yeah, please send any questions for you. I'm, I'm more than happy to get on calls with people if people want to have a longer conversation about broadcast. And well, to that note as well, in that information, um, when you send out the, the blog emails, if people can, if they think of anything they'd like to ask myself, um, anything that comes up after the fact, then please do feel free to mm -hmm. um, you know, to yeah. to use those channels as well to, yeah. to make contact and you know open up other discussions. Yeah, absolutely. Well, listen, guys, thank you very much. That was really thought provoking, very interesting. Um, hope everybody's enjoyed that. Um, I think we're happy enough to give you six minutes of your life back. Um, like Luke says, uh, any questions that you haven't thought of that comes to you later, send them over, and Luke will happily answer them. I say, Luke, I got myself. <laughs> All right, All right that's great. Cheers. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thanks very much, guys. Bye-bye. All the best.